Hi, this is a recorded lecture for the Alps NLP Winner School. Clearly, I'm having a lot of fun at the Alps virtually. I hope you're enjoying Alps as much as I do. So this lecture is going to be about common sense stuff. Why do we care? Well, despite human level or even superhuman level performances on a variety of leaderboards, today's state-of-the-art models are brittle when provided with adversarial or out-of-domain examples making such silly mistakes that humans would never make. And this is especially after they pretend to perform as well as the humans do on leaderboards. So it looks as if we know how to solve only a data set with the deep learning without solving the underlying task in a reliable and robust manner. What's going on? So there's a fundamental gap between how humans truly learn about how the world works Whereas deep learning models seem to learn data set specific patterns. And so when we think about this fundamental difference, uh, people studied, people in AI studied discussing more about the um, amazing complexity and mysterious uh, mechanisms of human intelligence. And in doing so, we often talk about this system one and system two reasoning distinction, which uh, became popularized in the field due to this book, Thinking Fast and Slow by the Nobel Prize winner, Daniel Kahneman. And in my mind, it's really great that um, AI researchers think more about human intelligence, though uh, it seems that there's a bit of a myth floating around in the community today that Perhaps we know how to do system one reasoning with deep learning, and we only need to figure out system two reasoning. And that's not quite right when we look at Kahneman's earlier work in which um, he identified the three cognitive systems, not just the two that were uh, highlighted in his later book that was meant for the more general audience. In any case, if we look at these three cognitive systems, there's a perception in addition to the system one and system two reasoning layers. And the perception and intuition together correspond to the, the uh, kind of reasoning that's a fast and parallel automatic effortless and associative. And then system two reasoning is the one that's effortful, slow, and it feels more logic-like. And importantly, when you look at this content layer on the bottom, uh, both system one and system two reasoning layers correspond to um, the content representations that require conceptual representations and reasoning about past, present, and future which implies some sort of a temporal and causal reasonings. And also uh, both can be invoked by language. So they both involve language significantly. And when we think about particular tasks corresponding to different layers, we often uh, think about solving puzzles or writing programs or proving logic theorems for system two type reasoning. But this is actually true for reviewing ACL papers or iClear papers, crafting iClear rebuttals, giving an invited talk or writing an op-ed. So for this kind of uh, language heavy activities, um, we also invoke a system to reasoning. And this contrast with perceptual level tasks such as object recognition and image segmentation and in between lies the intuitive reasoning or system one, which focuses on reasoning about preconditions and postconditions and reasoning about what happens before and after, uh, reasoning about motivations and intents of people and their mental and emotional states. And what's really fascinating about intuitive reasoning is that this is what humans do at every waking minute almost um, uh, reactively, subconsciously, we don't even uh, think consciously about this type of reasoning compared to system two reasoning, which we do only um, uh, 
uh, when we need to. So we can, as a human, we could spend hours or, or even days without invoking system to reasoning compared to system one. We just do this all the time subconsciously. So this talk will focus um, heavily on the system one type reasoning. And the best way to make this part more concrete is through an example, a uh, famous example known as Roger Shepard's Monsters in a Tunnel. So the point here is that what you see in this image is not just the two monsters in a tunnel. You see a story that the two monsters are running as opposed to standing still on one foot and one is chasing another rather than trying to copy his body movements. And the chaser has hostile intentions and the chased is afraid, even though the two faces are actually identical. What it means is that as a human, we tend to hallucinate stories based on our common sense understanding about how the world works and why people do what they do and what are the stereotypical things that people do and their stereotypical emotional and mental uh, reactions might be. So an important observation here, uh, actually two important observations are that first of all, none of these inferences is absolutely true. Uh, they are stochastic in nature and everything is defeasible with additional context. This is a really important point throughout this uh, class that unlike some of other kinds of inferences that humans do, logical inferences or mathematical inferences, when we worry only about what's absolutely true, common sense inferences in contrast are more probabilistic and stochastic in nature. And that's, uh, that point is really highlighted in these examples as well when we assumed that these monsters are running, even though we actually have really no reason to believe that that's true because they might as well be standing still on one foot. Um, and then a great deal of these types of intuitive inferences are common sense inferences, which are again, um, can be best described in natural language, just shown as shown here. Um, it's hard to imagine that we can so, uh, somehow create a fixed set of a small set of categorical labels and then try to describe all these events and human cognition, their mental states and intent and everything through a predefined set of simple categories. So we really need natural language in order to do this type of broad scope, common sense and intuitive inferences. So the TLDR so far is that um, we need to incorporate language as the symbols. In fact, all of it, not just the words or a set of words or you know, um, parse trees of words for the matter. And in fact, um, similar idea has been pitched by this other book, Surfaces and Essences by Douglas Hofstadter and Emmanuel Sender. By the way, you might recognize this name, Douglas Hofstadter, due to his other, perhaps more famous book known as uh, Guadalajara Bach. Um, and in this book, which is actually about analogy and concepts, the authors um, uh, make it clear that the number of categories or concepts in human minds vastly outnumber the number of words we have in human language. And in fact, a lot of the concepts require free form open text descriptions. So um, that's another um, reason as to why we need the full scope of language, including free form open text descriptions, not just the words or simple um, uh, phrases, fixed phrases that uh, act more like words. And then if you buy that, now what we uh, need to uh, take as another fact uh, at that point is that we do really need to think about reasoning as a generative task as opposed to a categorization task or a discriminative task. And that's because the space of reasoning in language becomes infinite. And so in this earlier example about what these monsters are doing, for example, you're not enumerating 
I don't know, a predefined set of a million sentences and score all of them one by one and then sort them in order to find what's the best sentence that describes uh, what, what these monsters are doing. So no human being does that. What's really magical about human intelligence is that we can think as we speak on the fly, almost word by word, without enumerating all possible sentences that might describe our intuitive reasoning. So we can just generate on the fly, word by word. And I think that's going to be a really important aspect of broad scope common sense reasoning going forward. Okay, so um, I'm going to also share one pointer to AI debate two uh, that happened in December 23rd last year. Uh, there will be another one next year on the same date. And I'd like to especially highlight um, what Daniel Kahneman uh, spoke at that uh, debate. It's only a few minutes, so I highly recommend that you watch it because um, he also clarifies all this myth about his system one and system two. Um, the simplified view is not what he meant to really say in his book, but there seems to be a bit of a confusion and um, so, and the rest of the debate was also a lot of fun and everything is available on this website. Um, so you might as well check that out if you're interested in what happened with other, uh, the rest of the debate as well. Anyhow, so let me share the plan of this class. So um, the part one of this uh, lecture will be about primarily about reasoning, especially through unsupervised inference time algorithms. And I'm going to give you three such examples. And the underlying theme, as you will see, is how to make lemonades uh, from off-the-shelf neural language models, implying that perhaps um, neural language models are not perfect. However, through algorithms, we might be able to draw the best or better out of them. And then the part two will be about knowledge. So part one is more about reasoning in some sense. Part two is reasoning slash knowledge. And then part three will be about benchmarks and algorithmic bias reduction. So um, the first segment of the part one will be about counterfactual reasoning and abductive reasoning through um, reasoning algorithm based on backpropagation. And let me first describe what abductive reasoning is, because I don't think this, um, this is really important reasoning type, uh, the type of reasoning that humans do, but it has not been as well studied in AI, or at least um, not in NLP as much. So let me give you an example. So, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> um, Given that past observations such as Ray hung a tire on a rope to make his daughter a swing, and then uh, in the future, we observe that Ray ran to his daughter to make sure that she was okay, uh, we can reason as a human what happened in between. So probably some accident happened. And this is um, the output of um, our algorithm. She hit the rope and uh, the tire fell on top of her. It's one of the many potentially reasonable um, hypotheses to have. So more formally, abductive reasoning or abduction um, is inference regard uh, about uh, inference that um, comes up with the best explanation to the partial observation. And this um, definition is due to Pierce um, 1960. And Importantly, abduction is quite different from more familiar kinds of inferences such as induction and deduction. When we think about induction and deduction, we typically only worry about um, given some hypothesis, uh, given some premise, what's um, implied from the premise uh, 100%. So induction and deduction worry about sort of um, um, restating some of the facts that are already provided in the premise, whereas abductive reasoning um, is more about coming up with new information that's not even uh, in the partial observation or premise provided. So unlike induction and deduction, 
abduction is really about creating new information. And that uh, aligns well with the nature of intuitive reasoning that I highlighted earlier, which is that uh, it's a stochastic in nature. We tend to create some story that's not necessarily guaranteed to be true, such as monsters are running as opposed to standing still on one foot. And so that's really uh, the nature of abduction. And in fact, this is what we do all the time as a human. We uh, reason about what people's motivation might be, even though we actually don't know for sure based just off of from their partial observation because we are trying to explain in our mind why people did what they did. Or when we see what happened, we're trying to reason about what might have caused that uh, partial observation. So abduction is a really important aspect of human common sense reasoning. And then another important one is counterfactual reasoning. And in fact, there's this uh, recent data set called the time travel so let me highlight that uh, one example from that um, data set. So it's based on five line simple stories, uh, such as Zach was throwing a party, all his friends were dressing up for his holiday party, etc. cetera. Um, he's sort of thinking about being a vampire or a wizard um, and then decided to dress like a skeleton. But what if um, this is Game of Thrones themed party. That's a TV show uh, instead of just any other Halloween party. In which case, perhaps um, we need to revise the rest of the story a little bit so that um, it goes better with the new second sentence in the story. So that's a new kind of actual context that we need to deal with. And so perhaps we might say, well, um, instead of saying vampire or skeleton, we want to say um, maybe Zach thought about being a Lannister, but didn't want to look like a Lannister and decided to be a Stark. So these are all characters in that TV show. So, um, and for, for this data set, um, the in order to make evaluation a little bit more manageable or limit the space of a story revision, um, the task um, requires uh, the, the model to rewrite the story or revise the story with minimal edit. Okay, so um, I just talked about two tasks or two reasoning, two types of reasoning, abductive and counterfactual reasoning, and they may seem very different, but there are some commonalities, um, important commonalities. So first of all, both involve non-monotonic reasoning, where they are types of non-monotonic reasoning. And also they both require thinking about uh, past context X and future context Z, or left context X and right context Z in language. So <coughs> uh, that particular kinds of um, uh, input that includes both the past and future uh, creates a particular challenge with today's uh, pre-trained neural language models because um, for language generation, we like to typically use left to right language models such as GPT-2, using which we can easily conditioning, condition on the uh, left context, but it's a little bit awkward to deal with the right context. And by the way, whatever we generate only conditioning on the left context will not necessarily be aligned with or consistent with the right context. So what we often do is to push both left and right into the left side context with some special symbol in between. And once you've done that, um, it's a little bit awkward to use pre-trained language models as is. So oftentimes we tend to do supervised fine tuning on top. Um, and it might work better, but still there may be some clunkiness or limitations to this type of approach because now we are messing with the natural ordering of the sentences. And so um, such models may not really uh, draw the best out of the original pre-trained language models. 
that has read the text only from left to right. And in fact, if you think about this, humans don't need to train this way either. Like we don't train ourselves to read one past sentence and one future sentence and then try to reproduce what was mis missing in between. We never need to train ourselves to do that in order to be able to do abductive reasoning or counterfactual reasoning with a variety of, or a mixture of left and right context. So um, the hypothesis here is that maybe uh, such operation should be possible even using left to right pre-trained language models without fine tuning. And so uh, one method to achieve that might be based on backpropagation. Now, uh, backpropagation is usually used only for um, training neural models, but occasionally, such as in image style transfer, such a method has been used as an inference time algorithm as well. So image style transfer, when they use backpropagation for image style transfer, the network parameters are already fixed and backpropagation is used only for modifying the input image to change the style through the style loss that's being backpropagated down to the input image without um, modifying the model parameters. So we could do something like that for natural language as well. Uh, unlike images though, natural language is discrete, which makes it a little bit uh, less clear how we might achieve this precisely. But here's one version of it, which is the Lorian decoding for non-monotonic logical reasoning. And let me give you some intuition about it just by visualizing the uh, algorithm uh, here. So we are going to do something what we always do, which is to condition on the left context and then compute the continuous representation of next sentence. And then we keep going in order to also compute the representation of uh, the future sentence Z so that we can then compute the loss function that we're going to use, which, may, which in this case might be the conditional probability of the future sentence given uh, X and Y. And at that point, we can do back propagation in order to improve um, the intermediate representation of Y. So at this point, the network parameters are already fixed because this is inference time algorithm we are doing. And we are uh, improving the intermediate representation of Y, continuous representation of Y in order to better um, optimize for the conditional probability of a future sentence Z. So this is going to have an effect of making the intermediate sentence Y to uh, describe something about the future or be prepared for the future sentence or be more consistent with the future sentence Z. Not only it's going to reflect left context, and now it's going to reflect what's in the right context as well. So we do that and we need to iterate this a um, couple of times, just like how backpropagation is iterative process in general, we're going to do forward and backward a couple of times. And in this particular method, we take um, interpolation between the, fo uh, the forward, um, the, the continuous representation of a Y during the forward pass and backward pass. There might be other ways of handling this, but this is what we tried in our uh, recent to work at EMNLP. In any case, at some point we converge and then we are going to now need to uh, convert this continuous uh, representation of a Y into some discrete sentence. And um, there might be different ways of converting this, but we did something simple in this uh, first step approach where we just took greedy sampling from each um, individual Y. And um, in fact, greedy is not quite perfect. Um, so in order to address that limitation, we actually um, generate multiple um, such samples based on slightly different, um, uh, the Y representation coming from different uh, iteration of that backpropagation. 
so that we have a multiple samples to choose from in the hope that we might find something slightly better in terms of um, final scoring function, which looks at both left and right collectively. But anyway, so more details in the paper, um, but that's the high level idea. And in fact, we can do almost the same thing for the counterfactual reasoning case as well. And because for counterfactual reasoning, we need to do minimal edit, here we're going to use loss function that's based on KL divergence between the original story ending and then the revised story ending. But otherwise we could do something almost identical. And in fact, the earlier example that you saw about Zach considering to be Lannister um, and then deciding to dress up like a Stark, this was an actual model output um, uh, based on this method. And that um, model, by the way, was GPT-2 without fine tuning on our uh, the, the time travel data set. So just off the shelf model with better inference time algorithm, uh, we can do uh, more advanced reasoning that um, off the shelf of pre-trained models may not seem to be able to do. So let me tell you a little bit more about evaluation, just highlighting the objective reasoning case. So in terms of human evaluation, uh, we're still far from human level performance. So green is the results based on DeLorean, which does a bit better than supervised method that's also in, uh, powered by Comet, which I'm going to talk about later in this class, which is um, neural common sense model trained on symbolic common sense graph. And so this does improve on top of a supervised model. And then um, it's, it's of course doing better than um, just zero shot off the shelf, based on off the shelf neural language models. So the fact that unsupervised DeLorean uh, beats a supervised model that's powered by um, common sense model uh, is promising, but still the gap from the human performance is quite big. So uh, a lot of work to be done really. And so how we might do that is going to be um, the one of the main questions that I'm going to try to address in the rest of the talk as well. But let me um, mention how automatic evaluation is really hard for this type of task because blue and rouge basically are not um, informative measure because um, the supervised model will basically learn the n-gram patterns in the target data set. That's quite stylistic. Um, and so without learning that style of language, of course, um, it's hard for DeLorean to beat supervised model performances, but DeLorean does perform better than unsupervised baselines. Um, and BERT score is, um, a little similar to the behavior of a bird score is a little bit similar to engram based measures like blue and rouge. So we have a um, similar problem here. So um, as we um, seem to be able to do better job at generating plausible text through neural language models, um, this automatic evaluation becomes really imminent and important uh, research challenge right now and the currently available methods are not able to handle this reliably. So we end up relying on human evaluation more and more in recent literature. So let me show you some examples from the model. Ray drove his car on a steep mountain road, and then later he was okay, but his car was totaled. So what happened in between? And Lorian generated that, oh, maybe he drove the car to the top of the mountain, and then his car is hit by a car. So that's fairly reasonable reasoning. And so what this one demonstrates is that um, perhaps a lot of this knowledge is implicitly available in larger scale pre-trained neural language models. But instead of always doing fine tuning supervised sequence to sequence models, perhaps we could um, think about fancier, uh, more informed in inference time algorithms as well. Here's another example for counterfactual reasoning. So in this story, Tara wanted to buy a new shirt for her upcoming school formal. And the original next sentence was that 
she went to the mall with her mom, but the new counterfactual context will be that she knew a really nice place online because it's COVID lockdown, she decided to order from online. I mean, you know, <laughs> I just um, modified the story a little bit, but um, basically the bottom line is that now she's going to order from online. So the original story ending, the third, the fourth, the fifth sentences are all about how they went to this uh, brick and mortar mall and tried the things on. And But now the new story ending needs to be adapted for the online shopping experience and the model algorithm was able to do that. So uh, they sent her a shirt implying this is the online store now. And um, so Tara tried it and uh, looking forward to wearing it. So no mention of actually going to the store anymore. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, that's that. And then let me show you another um, uh, study, case study that goes into similar um, line of a story that uh, we can actually do quite well with unsupervised inference time algorithms. But in this case, I'm going to highlight logical constraints for controlled text generation applications. So like I said earlier, we tend to do sequence to sequence modeling for a variety of conditional text generation, whether it's image captioning or dialogue response generation or machine translation, we, we tend to um, default to this uh, sequence to sequence models for supervised training. But um, maybe there are other ways of uh, doing at least some of these cases, not all. And let me highlight this new task, common gen. So common gen is a task where given a set of words like board, lose, write, fall, balance, the task is to generate a reasonable sentence that makes use of all the words provided. And it, when using fine-tuned or supervised sequence-to-sequence -sequence models, uh, the models sort of understand that I need to do something with these words. So it's going to use some words, but not all. So always some words will be missing. And that's understandable because the fine-tuning um, will not really be able to tell these models to um, specify what the semantics of the task is and what the logical constraints of the task might be. The fine tuning, um, no matter how large it turns out, no matter how large models we use, um, does not the, the, the fine tuned language models do not really learn this kind of a logical constraints. Now, what's interesting about this compared to what humans do is that, well, we actually don't need to train ourselves at all. We don't even need one example to train on. We can just hear what the task description is and then boom, we can do it right away. Just use all keywords. So similar things happen with translation as well in the following sense. Um, there are um, some languages with um, uh, more gendered um, inflection rules compared to how much there is in English and for those languages, uh, we just learn grammar rules and then we can apply that on the fly so that we wouldn't make such a mistake uh, that neural translation models make today uh, to convert uh, men to women because of the data set bias or language bias toward men. So um, there's this recent study by Stanovsky et al, uh, which focused on this gender bias in machine translation and they proposed this new task where um, you need to avoid this gender bias in these cases. So um, that's another example. And then also yet another example might be, um, so uh, I'll, I'll talk about another example in a bit, but the high level idea here is that um, perhaps we want to be able to incorporate logical constraints during decoding time on top of pre-trained off-the-shelf neural language models, a bit similar to how humans are perfectly able to do that at the decoding time without having to, uh, you know, do fine tuning or supervised training of ourselves on a particular task. So 
Um, here are other additional examples that for dialogue response generation, maybe you want to make sure certain information is mentioned. For recipe generation, perhaps you want to make sure that some ingredients are not used because maybe you don't want to use oil. And um, sometimes you might want only one of some options are being mentioned, but you're okay not if not all of them are used. So in general, um, we can convert the logical constraints to uh, conjunctive normal forms or CNF forms, which are the product of sums or you know a um, bunch of conjunctions on top of these clauses, and clauses are a um, bunch of disjunctions. So a bunch of disjunctions over literal. So uh, that's a bit of a recap about CNF forms. And when we have the original objective function, now we want to optimize some objective functions such as the probability of output given input subject to some logical constraints, which we can uh, rewrite into a, a new objective function where uh, we now have this additional term, which is a penalty term that will be um, added when uh, some terms are violated, some clauses are violated. So um, in order to do decoding out of this new objective, um, we propose this perturbed uh, beam search or some variant of a beam search that has uh, buckets corresponding to different diverse clauses. And um, I don't think the algorithmic details are very important, but um, the underlying, the takeaway message is that uh, we can modify the discrete BIM search so that we can incorporate, make sure that um, the constraints are satisfied as much as possible. So if we do do that on top of fine tuned language models, meaning supervised language models, then uh, like I said earlier, if you do regular BIM search or um, new sampling method called the nuclear sampling. Uh, either way, the model will not be able to satisfy all constraints. It will always make some mistakes. Whereas if we do neurologic decoding, uh, then all constraints are satisfied now. And the output sentence looks good as well. It turns out though, what's exciting is that it turns out it works even for off-the-shelf pre-trained language models, totally unsupervised. So with the conventional decoding method, such as beam search or nuclear assembling, um, of course, the model will not be able to do anything with this bunch of words because it doesn't understand what uh, the model is supposed to do. Whereas nucleus, uh, sorry, neurologic decoding, um, even though it's not even supervised at all, um, it can just do quite well right away. It turns out it can actually do even better than supervised method. So here, what we see is rouge, meteor, and coverage. Let's look at coverage first. So here, um, the green and yellow shows what happens with the neural logic on top of either supervised method or unsupervised zero-shot language models. Either way, the constraint satisfaction is almost 100% regardless of the model size. So this is the size of GPT-2 being used in our study. And uh, blue bar is what happens with the beam search. So uh, clearly the larger the model, the better. Um, the learning somehow understand that there's some constraint satisfaction that's implicitly there, but still it's a far off from being close to 100. Um, and you might wonder whether neurologic is achieving this high coverage at the cost of the language quality. So uh, the answer is shown on this rouge and meteor graphs, but it turns out um, even the language quality is better, at least for this common gen task. And in addition to that, to our big surprise, it's doing so much better so that it's actually the smaller networks with neurologic does better than larger network that's supervised. So that's usually what we uh, tend to see in many other benchmarks today. Usually the rule of thumb is that the larger, the better, but that's usually based on relatively simple decoding algorithm. But when we 
improve the decoding algorithm to incorporate the logical constraints, it turns out that we can do really quite well, even using smaller networks, even without supervision. Um, the paper provides uh, three additional um, applications or tasks where neurologic is tested. And we see similar patterns where uh, neurologic, when the task requires complex logical constraints can boost the performance quite well and quite fast without having to rely on supervision or large network size. So um, that's that. And finally, let me tell you a little bit about yet another types of decoding algorithm called um, reflective decoding. So this is our new work um, that's, uh, that can be used for unsupervised paraphrasing as well as abductive reasoning. And here's the intuition behind it. So in the case, I'm going to use a paraphrasing as a running example, and then I will show you how to generalize this for abductive reasoning case as well. But starting with the paraphrasing, so given a left to right language model, we can generate what comes next, uh, which we are going to name as contextualization step. So we can generate different kinds of sentences that can continue from the input sentence. And once we have a bunch of a context, then we can reflect off from that generated context or image in the context using reverse language model or right to left language model. And the idea is that maybe we can somehow generate the output at that point, which happens to be paraphrase of the input sentence. How would that be possible? Well, perhaps possible because of this um, distributed the semantic uh, style intuition that meaning of input uh, may be roughly the meaning of a context. In fact, not just the future context, but probably context for the past as well, which actually we do use, but simplified in this visualization. So meaning of the input may be meaning of its neighbors. So that's a distributed the semantics. And we might be able to invoke that for neural uh, language decoding as well. And then once we have that, then things that are generated from the meaning of the context might be the paraphrase of the meaning of the input. And slightly more formally, we might say S as hat and context as a CI and what we want to do is something like this. So we want to reduce um, our, um, the intuition behind the, the, this S hat, the paraphrase is that when we try to regenerate uh, or when we try to generate the uh, context C, the green cloud conditioning on either the original paraphrase or original input sentence versus paraphrased input, we wish that um, their conditional probability distribution over this context to be similar. If the paraphrase is a good paraphrase of the source sentence, then naturally this should be small. The distance should be small. And that's one intuition. Another intuition is that for different contexts, um, when we think about you know, generating different contexts, um, they different contexts will be um, different for the purpose of regenerating the source context, source sentence. So when we look at the reverse uh, language model, we can think about how well does the particular context that happens to describe the original input, um, and based on that, so the intuition being, if the conditional probability of original input given the context is higher, then such context is a good context describing the meaning of input better. So we can weigh different contexts using different weight um, in order to um, weigh uh, the role of different contexts differently. And then we can combine this as a product of experts. So in the end, we can generate this new paraphrase using a product of experts over this collection of 
left to right, sorry, right to left, the reverse language model. So that's a reflection. And in fact, uh, like I briefly mentioned earlier, we do this for both directions, not just for the future context, but also for the past context as well. And so how do we generalize this for the abductive reasoning case? Is that, uh, well, actually the idea is quite simple. We can concatenate the two sentences corresponding to past, future context. Um, we can continue to generate their even more future context and then their even more past context. And then using those two together, now we can regenerate uh, what may happen in the middle, and that can be the uh, basically the hypothesis sentence that could come in between these two sentences with a gap. And more details in the paper, but let me just highlight one thing from the paraphrasing evaluation. So um, blue has been used for a while in paraphrasing, but it turns out you can game this by nearly copying and pasting the original source sentence as is without paraphrasing, sometimes not at all. And so sorry is a new method proposed by other researchers that accommodates for novelty as well in order to penalize such conservative models that uh, make very minimal to no paraphrasing. So in terms of sorry and human evaluation, um, we, uh, our method based on unsupervised reflective decoding can beat supervised BART. And BART, by the way, is probably, well, last time we checked that that was the best supervised model based on pre-trained model that uh, acts more like a paraphrasing and other generative generation task. And so in terms of sorry and human evaluation, uh, we performed better than BART, but not as much based on blue because if you uh, use blue, we have a similar problem that I mentioned earlier for abductive reasoning case as well, which is that if you learn the data set specific language pattern, then you can do better with the blue type uh, scores like a blue that really looks at the engram patterns of the data set. So this is um, promising results together. And in order to summarize what we've seen so far, I've shown you three case studies of unsupervised inference time algorithms, and they have interesting contrast. So the first one was in some sense, neural search. The second one was discrete search. And in fact, discrete search has been, or had been an important area of AI research for some time, perhaps um, not as actively in recent years, at least not in NLP, but you know, search algorithms such, such as A star algorithms and um, other kinds of um, improved, improved BIM search has been um, quite active area of research in early AI research. And I think we can bring that back for neural language models in order to support uh, better, more interesting reasoning uh, capabilities out of from the neural language models. And then Lastly, the reflective decoding is somewhere in between in some sense that it's kind of discrete, but not quite in the conventional um, discrete search sense. It's a little bit more distributional in that um, it's based on a collection of imagined context, which is a collection of a sample. It's just so perhaps a little bit more particle filtering like, but not quite. So it's a summer, I would say this is a little bit somewhere between neural search and discrete search. And my speculation is that there may be even more different kinds of search algorithms in this spectrum of being discrete and neural that we have not been uh, thought about, which might really help making better lemonades out of off-the-shelf neural language models. So before I move to the second part of the talk, um, let me discuss a little bit about the current paradigm of deep learning and what's wrong, so wrong about the supervision on a lot of exam problems, because that's pretty much what it boils down to right now. 
which of course builds on top of a self-supervised models um, that tries to guess what word is missing in between or what word is missing next. So it turns out this recipe works primarily for categorical uh, task on leaderboards, but they fail on generative evaluation such as abductive reasoning, counterfactual story revision, and various text generation tasks with logical constraints. So this current paradigm that we've been loving so much is not very powerful when um, we think about generative evaluation. And in fact, um, it's good to question ourselves whether this paradigm even makes sense. So imagine taking a deep learning class in which uh, you go to class, uh, there's no lecture. The professor gives you a lot of exam problems, multiple choice questions with the correct answer. As a human, I don't think we can really learn very well in that learning mode where there's no lecture, just a lot of exam problems. We probably can learn something. So, um, in fact, a lot of deep learning researchers agree on the fact that there's something broken up about this kind of a supervision, because at the end of the day, uh, we end, to, uh, end up learning exam writers' biases, the exam specific patterns. So we can learn to pick the correct answer without studying properly. So as a result, deep, you know, some deep learning researchers pounded the table for self-supervision as the way to go. And I am very much um, a big fan of self-supervision myself. And I work on that to some degree, at least for uh, language and vision uh, models as well. However, I don't believe that that's going to really lift everything all the way uh, up because of the following reason. Imagine even as a human, um, the professor, instead of giving you a lot of exam problems and now give you a lot of deep learning code and we need to figure something out by self-supervision. And you might think, oh, I know how to read the Python code, but, or PyTorch. What if the code is given in an entirely new language written in uh, Russian or Korean that you may not understand? So in that learning mode, even humans cannot learn very well. Humans really rely on uh, lectures, textbooks, and tutorials for more efficient learning. And I wonder whether we should really deeply think about that for AI as well. How do we learn? How do we teach AI deep learning models uh, using declarative knowledge in the way that humans learn? So that's going to be the second part of this uh, class, which will be about supervision with the declarative knowledge for the purpose of knowledge modeling. Um, maybe I'm going to take a break here though, so that um, I can make um, two separate recordings with roughly one hour each. So I'll be back and see you in a bit.